He spent that Christmas at home in London with Dr. James Simpson, an old friend from Edinburgh who had also caught the anaesthetic's bug. Simpson was fired up with enthusiasm about ether. He immediately rushed back to Edinburgh to try it on his own patients in childbirth. He at once recognised that ether did have some drawbacks. He wanted to look for something with all the advantages of ether, but none of the disadvantages, and that was what he set out to do. Simpson went in search of any substance that would vaporise. He wanted to know which ones would send you off to sleep if inhaled. Over the next few months, Simpson and his assistant inhaled acetone, benzene, chloride of hydrocarbon and dozens of other chemicals in search of something that would knock him out. As you can imagine, this had a very bad effect on him. Uh, frequently, he found himself so hoarse in his throat that he couldn't lecture the next day. He was sometimes laid up in bed and ill for a quite a while after the experiments. Uh, his family were clearly quite upset about it, but nothing was ever going to dissuade him from carrying on. On the 4th of November, 1847, as Simpson groggily worked his way through the shelves of the local pharmacy, he eventually found a solvent called chloroform. It was good. Very good. Simpson was found unconscious on the floor. When he came round, he didn't remember a thing. Simpson, in his life um, as an obstetrician, had seen many complicated births and labours. I mean, because of poor nutrition in those days, many women had deformed pelvises and they suffered horrendously. And very often the child died and there was a high mortality rate amongst the mothers too. He had seen enormous suffering. Um, he was quite sensitive to the suffering of his patients and he wanted to alleviate it. Simpson was determined to bring some relief to this process and put some fizz into his social life at the same time. He set up a dinner party for the cream of Edinburgh society. Once the plates were cleared away, Simpson's guests were each given a glass of fizzy water mixed with chloroform. One, two, three, down! Simpson became so merry, he's reported to have stood on his head. Other guests fancied themselves as angels or broke out in uncontrollable laughter. The party decided the stuff was so potent they wanted it taken away. Well, those guests who were given the chloroform champagne described it as heady. I imagine that they were feeling distinctly light-headed, intoxicated, possibly um, uh, maybe a little aroused, one feels, because it did have this slight aphrodisiac effect. Anyway, it wasn't the kind of thing you needed at a Victorian dinner table. Below stairs, the cook decided to try this exciting beverage herself. She too passed out. Simpson was now convinced this was the stuff to give to pregnant women. But his plan to give women pain relief during childbirth hit an unexpected obstacle. There was one clergyman in particular who said that chloroform was a decoy of Satan designed to rob God of the deep, earnest cries that ar arise in times of trouble. Simpson fought back against the religious objections. He published his own pamphlets and produced articles arguing that if you're going to condemn chloroform on biblical grounds, you could argue that travelling in a carriage or wearing a hat also goes against God's will. But it wasn't just the church that was against chloroform. Doctors opposed chloroform for a variety of reasons. Some of them said, quite rightly, we just don't know what it does to the human body. And then, of course, there was Dr. Green, who said that it caused erotic dreams. He actually said that one woman had offered to kiss the male attendant while she was giving birth. This was something he found personally revolting and thought that women would rather die than have this happen to them. He also said that women under the influence of chloroform uttered coarse language, in itself sufficient reason that it should never be given to English women. The tide of public opinion began to shift as two celebrity mothers opted for a chloroform birth. Kate Dickens, the wife of Charles, was about to give birth to her eighth child. Dickens had met Simpson and been enthused about chloroform. Then, in 1849, when Kate gave birth to Henry Fielding Dickens, she did so with the assistance of chloroform. Afterwards, Dickens wrote that the shock to his wife's nervous system was reduced to nothing, and she was, to all intents and purposes, well the next day. 
Dickens' writings widened interest in chloroform. Then, in 1853, the most famous celebrity mother imaginable joined the cause. Queen Victoria was pregnant with Prince Leopold. She'd already experienced seven agonising deliveries and had decided that pain in childbirth was not a divinely appointed gift, whatever the men of the church said. I think Queen Victoria opted for a chloroform birth for the same reason as any woman would do. She found the birth experience extremely painful and she'd heard good things about chloroform. And certainly of uh, the two previous births, she'd made inquiries about it, but it had never quite got to the stage of actually agreeing to. And then for the birth of Prince Leopold, they asked Dr Snow to come to court and he put on his best hat and his sword and off he went. Queen Victoria became a great fan of chloroform with some startling consequences. When her eldest daughter, Vicky, was about to give birth, she sent her a bottle of chloroform. Vicky's labour was lengthy and complicated. It was believed that both she and the baby would die. Fortunately, a doctor arrived who knew how to use chloroform. Vicky inhaled it, and he was able to turn the baby, which was in a breech position, to enable it to be born normally. The baby looked dead. He applied artificial respiration, and at last, it took its first breath, and it survived. That child was the future Kaiser Wilhelm II, who led Germany into the First World War. Simpson eventually won his battle, and chloroform became a mainstay of anaesthetics for childbirth and other operations. His opponents were gracious in defeat. After his death, a memorial honouring Simpson's work was erected in Westminster Abbey. After two years of intense excitement, the world had gone from having no anaesthetics to having three of them ether, laughing gas and chloroform. And the search was still on for the perfect knockout substance with no side effects. But this didn't mean the end of pain in operations. One senior doctor who was surrounded by the traumatised young men shot up in the Crimean War decided that pain relief was unmanly. He tried to ban anaesthetics. In 1854, Britain and Russia went to war in the Crimea. It was the most severe winter in living memory.